Hi there, and welcome back to the Energy Sector Heroes podcast. My name is Michelle Fraser, and every week I will speak with incredible people who share their lessons, experiences, and stories from their time spent in the energy sector. Hi there, and welcome back again to this week's episode. If you're new to the show, then please take a second to subscribe and even consider sharing the show with just one other person. This week, I am joined by Brett Simon. Brett is an incredible director of commercial strategy. Brett, would you like to introduce yourself, please? Yeah, sure. Thanks, Michelle. Really appreciate you reaching out to me and having me on the show here. You know, and so I am the director of commercial strategy at eZinc. eZinc is a long duration uh, battery storage OEM, OEM meaning uh, original equipment manufacturer. Uh, The company itself is headquartered in uh, Toronto, Canada. I myself am based out of Northern New Jersey, where we have our uh, our US-based office. Um, I've I've been in this role now uh, almost half a year, but I've been in this industry for uh, over eight years now, uh, background working uh, in commercial strategy at at another battery storage firm. And also for a little over five years, I was a third-party market analyst uh, and consultant. Okay. Sounds amazing. So what is corporate strategy then? Well, corporate communication strategy. So my my focus is less on the communication side and more on the commercial strategy as it relates to actually getting um, commercial commercial deals and commercial positioning going. So a, a lot of my work kind of breaks down into areas like analyzing the competitive landscape. So, you know, understanding, you know, what are our competitors offering in terms of pricing, in terms of technical specifications? How are they structuring their projects? Understanding the economics of different projects, so running running models and understanding, you know, if we're gonna if us if a client wants a project of a certain size and configuration and use case, you know, how do we have to price that project such that you know both are our client receives a uh, an attractive uh, payback, as well as you know us receiving uh, you know a, a a sufficiently high uh, threshold of of revenue. I also look at things like you know customer segmentation. So if there are specific verticals that could be attractive to us, and understanding you know how could we configure projects to support them. I also am the manager of our internal uh, customer relationship management software. So that's a tool where we basically look at, you know, what's the size of our pipeline? What's the distribution of our pipeline across uh, different stages of deal maturity? You know, what's kind of the the size ranges of our deals? What is the, you know, doing things like loss analysis, which is understanding when we, when we lose deals, which of course does happen for, for any company. Why, why are we losing and what can we learn from that to improve our overall uh, operations, whether it's changing things around our, our strategy, our technology, our, our customer type, all those, all those different things. So really it's a, it's a pretty broad cross cutting role. I guess the last thing I'd say is also uh, thought leadership is, is really the last uh, big piece of it where I really have a lot of responsibility thinking about how do I position our company and our team to really get out there in the industry and, and be seen as thought leaders and provide our insights and help kind of shape the future of this industry. So that really involves a lot of identifying opportunities for speaking, uh, participating in different trade organizations and making sure uh, our voice is heard. Okay. That sounds like a really interesting position, actually. So how do you go about seeing what your competitors are doing so that your your company's competitive when they're you know bidding for a project sure so so i would i would say that there's there's both an aspect of primary and an aspect of secondary research to that so the the primary research side is generally things like you know talking to uh you know talking to different clients or potential clients in the market and hearing things, you know, and it, and sometimes it's as, it's as simple as them saying something like, you know, Hey, you know, your, your competitor is, has specifications of, of X and you're offering specifications of, of Y, you know, and that's, that's why we would, we would choose them over you. Other times the primary research can be a lot more nuanced where it can involve sometimes a, a little bit more detailed studies 
where, you know, we might, we might look at things like, you know, uh, spec sheets that a competitor has put out or case studies that they've put out on a project or, or other such announcements, and then doing some internal analysis to understand, you know, you know, okay, what, what are, what are they doing, you know, what are they doing very well and what can, what can we learn from that? And then the, the, the secondary side, I would say is more like, you know, reading, reading news articles or attending webinars and, and just, again, trying to see what we can, what we can learn from it. Because, you know, there's, there's a, a lot of companies that are doing really great things in this industry. And I think, you know, there's, there's always, there's always something new due to learn and, and, you know, everyone can always, always be better and, and always improve. Okay. Cause I have been involved in, in a bidding situation before, and it always surprises me that each and every company bar the price, which always varies a little bit, but they all put in the same sort of the same sort of bid. How do you know what to put down when you're bidding? Though? That's that's a great question. So I think really the most important thing at the end of the day is actually one of Easing's core values, which is truth. At the end of the day, it always comes down to truth. So it's when when we're putting out a bid, we're trying to put out the best one that we possibly can. And it's basically saying, you know, taking all the information we have, all the things we can offer, let's just do the best we can. And so again, that goes back to truth because, you know, what we what we don't want to do is overpromise and underdeliver. We want to only promise things that we can truly give and and win on the on the value of our of our solution. And the fact of the matter is, lowest price doesn't always win because there's there's a variety of considerations, right? You have to think about you know, what can the technology do? What are this company's uh, bona fides that you can rely on? There, there's there's a lot of different factors that really go into winning winning a bid. Okay. So how do you evaluate and turn it into lessons learned when you don't win a bid, a bid then? Because that must be difficult. Yeah, yeah, it's it it is, you know, it can be hard because you know a lot of work can go into these processes and it's it's not just me by myself at all, right? Uh there's a whole team. And you know, frankly when it comes to actually submitting a proposal to a client, I would say, you know, the amount of work that I contribute to the final proposal is probably 5 to 10%. It's really a lot of other people on the team who do most of the heavy lifting. It's, you know, the application engineers who are coming up with things like the actual project design and site layout. It's it's people like the uh, the BD leads who are negotiating directly in terms of in terms of the pricing. So there's there's really a lot of work that has to go in. But when we when we do lose a deal, there is an aspect of trying to take stock of it and record what we can learn. So often what we'll do is we'll actually ask the client if they're willing to get on the phone with us for even just five or ten minutes and and share some feedback and. Most of them are willing. Most of them are willing to do that. They're they're kind enough to give of their time and and their knowledge, and they'll they'll share information with us and tell us, you know, hey guys, we really liked aspects A, B, C of your bid, but really, you know, items D and E are where you fell short, and and that really is good information for us because we can take that back and we can digest it and we can say, okay, you know, next time we do this, let's let's do it this way. And we actually have a very good internal review process where every quarter. We, we do a full analysis of our, our pipeline and we look at what deals did we, did we lose? What were the primary reasons we lost from them? And then what are we going to do next quarter and beyond to really integrate those lessons learned into all of our processes? Okay. So when you're, having a, when you're bidding for a project, do you have to then give a presentation or what do you, how, how is it? Or do you just? Uh, it's uh, that's a good question. So, really, any customer relationship, especially in an industry like energy storage, it can can vary. But in general, you know the the sales cycle is such that there always is an education component. So, usually, we make presentations before the official proposal. Uh, usually, the the process is such that you know we'll we'll learn about an opportunity or a lead. We'll get on the phone with the client. We'll have a chat with them, usually 30 minutes to an hour, tell them about who we are, what our technology does, what we can offer them. We'll hear a bit from them about the solutions that they're trying to solve. And then usually what ends up happening is, you know, we have a, we have a couple more conversations and, and these conversations can take place over, over multiple months. And sometimes in between them, there'll be 
action items. So, you know, we might run some models for them. You know, I might take some data from them, run some models. Then the next time we meet up, we'll show them and we'll say, hey, based on these inputs you gave us, this is the value we think we can provide for you. And, and usually what it ends up with is we write up uh, a formal, uh, what's called a firm proposal, uh, which is a which is a document uh, that, that outlines a variety of things. You know, it has a lot of information about our technology. It talks about the specific project, you know, the, the size of the project, the pricing, any sort of, um, of service that we might include in the contract, the expected delivery date of the project, the s- details about the site layout, and usually we submit that to the, to the client. And then, you know, usually also on that proposal, there's kind of a, a, a date of, you know, the proposal is valid through day X. And then, you know, after that date, you know, the, uh, you know, before that date, a decision has to be, has to be reached. And, you know, that's, you know, and again, that can, that can vary depending on a number of factors, but usually it's, you know, it's a couple of weeks to give the client time to, to talk through it and, and figure out if it makes sense uh, for them to, to move ahead. Okay, so have you ever had to negotiate your bid that you've had to put in if the client has come back? Uh, to anything? So the the team will, but that's really not my role. So so you could almost think of me. I'm trying to think of a of a of a good of a of a good analogy here. You, you might almost think me like someone. Uh, I can't even think of the name of the position. But the 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 guy in American football who holds the ball for the for the kicker, because you know really what I'm doing is is I'm I'm helping set things up. So really I'm doing a lot more of the kind of early to mid stage stuff. You know I'm identifying opportunities. I'm running economic models to show whether an opportunity is viable or not. You know I'm supporting the client through the process with telling them insights. You know helping them understand the market because. Some of these clients, um, you know, they, a lot, you know, our, our clients are very smart. They're very knowledgeable, but some of them are newer specifically to the energy storage industry. So sometimes I'll do a little education teaching them about, you know, this is the state of the storage industry. This is the value storage can provide. These are some different incentives that we can tap into. These are some programs you, you need to be aware of in this market. And then, you know, really it's the, it's the, it's the BD team and sales and application engineering who really take things over starting at the proposal stage that are really responsible for basically putting together a commercial offer and saying, this is what we can offer you. You know, this is the price. This is when we can, when we can deliver it. Okay. So negotiating the terms and and conditions is not really your area then. No, not at all. That's that's yeah. That's that's beyond uh, beyond my expertise. Okay, okay. So when you're trying to find out where all the projects that you're going to bid for, how would you how would you do that? Do you get sure. or? It's a very good question. So so when it comes to lead generation broadly, there's kind of two two categories, right? Of of ways that that we can get leads. So one is. Uh, is what's called opportunistic. And the other is what, you know, what I would call trying to try to think what the term is. I'm, I'm blanking on it. So one's opportunistic and the, the other is more so when you kind of come up with a campaign. So I'll call it campaign based. So with with campaign with opportunistic leads, these are things like, you know, for example, you know, we'll see someone put out an RFP and we'll respond to it. Or you know, some, one of our, you know, one of our investors or one of our clients will give us a call and say, Hey, we know about these guys. They're looking for a battery system in, you know, this region for this purpose. Can you guys give them a call? I think it might be a good fit. So those are kind of more the opportunistic things, things that kind of, you know, we, we hear about that come, come across our desk. And, you know, obviously those, those are great. And and we respond to those, but then the others, the kind of more, campaign based, or maybe it's better to call it more targeted because not all of them are a campaign is where, you, you know, our team and, and often, you know, I, I will, I will lead this is kind of trying to identify key opportunities early, basically looking at trends in the market and saying, huh, this is interesting. I've noticed this trend. Why don't we come up with a way we can go after this? You know, what's something that we can do here of saying, you know, why, you know, just uh, to, to make up a, a facetious example, right? Let's say that, you know, there's a, there's a trend of a need for storage 
for, let's just say, uh, plastic manufacturers. And I, I notice this trend and I say, look, I'll make a model and then I'll email, you know, the top, you know, I'll email or call, let's say the top 25 plastic manufacturers in the specific region where the opportunity is. You know, I'll do an outreach and say, you know, hi, my name's Brad. I represent Zinc. This is our, this is our system. This is what it can do. This is the value I think can provide for you. Would you be open to having a, a 30 minute conversation with me to learn a little bit more? And so that that's kind of this targeted opportunity where we can we can really drill down into some of these opportunities and and identify them uh, early and and those can be uh, those can be quite exciting. Okay, so what kind of training did you have to undergo to to get the type this type of job? Oh gosh, well that's that's a fun question. I get to I get to tell my life story. I think I think this is this is this is an awesome an awesome question. So. I have known that I wanted to work in some kind of sustainability field since I was 17 years old. I I took a course in AP environmental in AP environmental science when I was 17 in, in high school. And I loved that class. My my teacher, Ms. Bishop, I give her a lot of credit. She was someone very important to me, really helped get me interested in environmental science. And so I knew already when I was going to college that I wanted to do something with environmental science. I just didn't know exactly what. So flash forward uh, to when I was a sophomore at uh, at uh, NYU, New York University in, uh, in New York City. And I realized as I was taking classes, I felt like energy was the one through line for every class that I took. I was, I was realizing, you know, that it was just connecting everything. And so I thought, okay, I want to work, I want to work in energy, but I didn't know exactly what I wanted to do in energy. I didn't know how exactly I was going to get there, but I knew I wanted to do something with energy and, and specifically, you know, more on the on the renewable side. So I, I graduated college and I did not immediately go into the energy industry. I, I worked for about a year and a half in public works and I, you know, I networked, I talked with different people, and I, I came to realize that if I really wanted to get where I was going in renewable energy, I would, I would need to go to graduate school. Uh, so I, I ended up going to the University of Michigan School of Natural Resources, the environment, which today I think is called the School of Environment Sustainability, SEAS. And, and while I was there, I took a lot of energy-focused classes, and I, I learned a lot to really kind of prepare myself, learning, um, you know, different, different uh, policy aspects, different aspects of how energy markets are structured, and and there I actually started getting really interested in energy storage. I was I was enamored by it, and I did I did a, a student consulting project when I was a student there for a a solar developer who was interested in getting into the storage market. So myself and a team of I believe four other students did some analysis of of different storage market opportunities over the course of a few months, and we presented it to the to the, the developer, and they they were very pleased with with what we did. And so I felt great about that. And then I also did a, a class project for an energy class that I took about storage and, and really felt like I had a very decent understanding of it and, and strong interest in it. So um, flash forward to my final semester in college, uh, I, or sorry, grad school, and I found out about an opportunity at GTM Research, which was part of a, a company called, called Green Tech Media, which I'm sure a lot of listeners uh, know about and, and remember fondly, Green Tech Media was a company that had basically three arms, uh, a, a research and consulting arm called GTM Research, a news arm called Green Tech Media, which was a website which, which had you know, a ton of great articles. And then the, the third arm uh, was, was GTM Events, which would organize conferences. And I, I was actually, I found out about this opportunity for an energy storage analyst role. And I applied and I interviewed and I was I was lucky enough to be offered. I was actually the second person hired for their storage team. The, the first was a, a, a gentleman who became my mentor, uh, Ravi Mangani, great guy, one of the thought leaders in energy storage worldwide. I mean, this this guy, a lot of, again, a lot of listeners have probably heard his name. He, he knows a ton about energy in general and, and storage very specifically. And I was I was lucky enough to to work with him and learn from him. And the way I learned a lot of what I know is just on the job. You know, I came in with, you know, like I said earlier, a decent understanding of storage and, and energy markets, but there was a lot 
that I didn't learn in the classroom that I had to learn on the job, you know, like how to make an economic model or um, how to understand the difference between different types of, of regulated or deregulated markets, you know, understanding kind of the, the value chain of energy storage. So I, I learned a lot of that on the job. And then on the commercial side, a lot of the knowledge I gained there was also on the job, but but at not not at GTM was actually at at EOS uh, Energy Enterprises, which I, I worked at after I left GTM, which by that point had been acquired and became uh, Wood McKenzie. I I worked at EOS with a with a, a gentleman named Balky Iyer, who uh, who who was my manager there and, and taught me a lot about about kind of the commercial process, how how things are done, how to generate leads. How to position a an emerging technology to uh, to a client and explain things in a very direct way because I had I had much more of a kind of third party analyst brain which was a lot more like give people all the information you know talk through things in a lot of you know still still be fairly succinct but talk about it in a lot of detail and I, I had to really learn how to to winnow that down a lot. So, you know, definitely very uh, indebted to, to Balky and a lot of what he taught me. And in fact, Balky is also the guy that I work for now. <laughs> I, I, still, I still work for him just in a different role in a different company now. But, you know, it's, it's very exciting that I've had this arc. And, you know, it took, it took a long time. I mean, from me being 17 when I first wanted to work in sustainability to when I was 20 and wanted to work in sustainable energy I, you know, I didn't have a job in that till I was 25, you know, and yeah, here, here I am now, uh, 33. So it's been, you know, been eight years in this, uh, in this industry. <laughs> okay. I hope that answers your question. It was a bit of a, bit of a long, a bit of a long one, but. <laughs> no, no, that did answer my questions. So what do you think is the most challenging thing about your current role then? About my current role? Ooh, that's a very good question. It's a very good question. I, I I'm gonna I'm gonna give two I'm gonna give two answers to that because it's it's hard to pick just one thing as the most challenging you know I I think one I, you know I'll say I'll say one is an aspect of I'm trying to think how I want to phrase this so I, I think I think one thing that's definitely very challenging for me is I would say trying to figure out how to do everything right you know it's we're definitely in a state where there's a lot going on, you know, not just, not just at Zinc, but in the energy industry in general, the energy storage industry more specifically, there's just so many things, so many trade organizations, conferences, webinars, meetings. There's so many things happening every day that are so exciting. And, you know, it's, you know, I, I do my best to stay on top of it, but I, I can't learn and I can't hear everything. So I think definitely a, a, a challenge is, you know, I would say knowing, you know, sometimes knowing what to, what to focus on because everything is important to some degree. Um, you know, ev everything is important. So just figuring out, you know, what, you know, what I should, what I should focus my, my limited time on. And, you know, the, you know, the, the, the lucky thing is being in the position I am now, excuse me, I have, I have some people I can delegate certain things to. So it's a matter of sometimes deciding, you know, okay, you know, is this something that I need to attend or take on myself? Or is this something that I can ask someone else to take the lead on and then follow up with them afterwards to get, you know, a summary? I mean, I think yesterday was a perfect example. Uh, I had two trade organization meetings that were booked at the exact same time. So there was no possible way I could attend both. So what I had to do is I had to think about it and say, okay, which of these is, is my, my number one priority? And I said, okay, well, this one is one where I personally, me as, as Brett Simon, needs to participate verbally and, and share opinions and, and have a discussion. So I said, this one is the one I have to go to. So the other one, I had to decide, you know, who, who from my team would be the right person to send. And, you know, I picked someone and I said, you know, hey... I need you to attend this meeting. You know, I need you to to take some notes and and share thoughts from that meeting. And it ended up working uh, working out fine in the end. But you know, in a, in an ideal world, I would you know I would attend every meeting. I would I would read every every paper. I would you know I would I would look at every every model. You know, and but it's I think a a a, hum, a humbling knowledge that when you get to kind of where you are in my career, which is a a sense that 
you know, you have to, you have to accept that even though you want to do everything, you can't, you just have to choose, you have to choose, you have to delegate, and then you just have to do your best. Okay. So do you delegate a lot, a lot of your work? Because you're quite young to, to be in that type of role that you are just now. Do you find it difficult? Do you think age is, has, has hindered you in climbing the career ladder? Uh, I don't think age has hindered me at all. I think one thing about the energy, at least the energy storage industry, it's hard for me to speak to other aspects of the industry, but I think one thing about the energy storage industry is it's a it's a relatively young industry in terms of how old the industry is, right? I mean, we've had, you know, pumped hydro storage in some form for, you know, depending on how you classify it, you know, some, you know, some people say hundreds of years, you know, but if it's kind of the 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 you know, energy grid pumped hydro storage that I think we've had for maybe about maybe 70 years in, in some form or another, but kind of the, the modern energy storage industry with, you know, battery storage and, and thermal storage and flywheels and all of that, that's really, that really only has existed since around, you know, 2010. And it really only started taking off around probably, you know, 2015, 2016, right around the time I got into the industry, in fact. And so I think as a result, there's definitely a sense of merit being what uh, what decides how far you go in in this industry. You know, if you can if you can prove you can do the work, you know, you will you will receive accolades and you will receive credit. You know, I know people who are who are younger than me who have some some very high positions in this industry that are that are completely justified and, and well deserved. So, you know, it's, it's definitely a learning process, you know, learning to, to manage people and, and delegate, you know, is definitely a, you know, always a learning process. And, and luckily I've, I've had the chance to do that a little bit before this current role, but, you know, certainly I don't think age has been a hindrance. In fact, I think in, in terms of my career, you know, I'm, I'm very proud of how far I've been able to come. Is there anything that you still want to achieve in your career then? Oh, plenty. <laughs> oh gosh, plenty. I think, I think it would be a bad sign. You know, I think it'd be a very bad sign if I said that, you know, I felt like I'd done everything I wanted to do. Uh, you know, I think, I think that would be, you know, it, cause, cause I think one, one thing in life is you have to always have, you always have to have curiosity and you always have to have striving, right? You know, there's always more things that I want to understand and I want to try to do, you know, I mean, I think, you know, I, I, you know, I, I don't want to be, I don't want to be cynical, but I think definitely, you know, if, if you want to work in energy and you want a job that's, you know, very, you know, every day is the same, you know, you have very, a lot of predictability. There are plenty of jobs like that. And if that's what you want to do, that's totally fine, but that's not kind of what excites me. You know, I mean, if you, again, if you look at my, if you look at my resume, pretty much all the places I've worked, you know, when I, when I came into them, you know, could still, could still be called, you know, a startup in a lot of cases, a late stage startup, but, but still a startup. So I, I like being in places where I'm challenged, where I have a lot of opportunity to learn and, and really make an impact because, you know, I think, you know, I, I want to see the renewable energy industry grow and there's a long way we have to go. So, I mean, I feel like I'll feel like, at you know the end of my career, which I hope is not for many years, I'll feel like I've really achieved something if I can look back and I can say, you know, all those, you know, all those targets for renewable energy and storage and everything. Not only did we meet them, but we, but we smashed them. You know, that's that's what I really want to see. You know, I want to, you know, there's 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 no better feeling I think I've had in my career than when, you know, I know that I've contributed to something that was impactful, that I've, you know, that I've succeeded in something. And I've said, oh, I know that that work I did contributed to that project coming to fruition. Okay. That sounds amazing. Right. So with so much things to do every day, because it sounds like your, your role would be quite really demanding. How do you actually manage your time then? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. So a lot of it is a matter of, you know, first off, you know, being being organized, right? You know, I make sure that I look at my calendar on a regular basis, right? Usually every day before I log off for work, I look at my calendar for the next day and I kind of mentally prepare myself and I go, you know, okay, at, you know, these are the meetings I have tomorrow. 
this is the headspace I have to get in. Is there anything I have to do to prepare before those meetings? So, so a lot of it is, is being organized and also, you know, following up with, with members of my team internally saying, you know, Hey, you know, you, I know you have me on this meeting at, you know, two o'clock. Is there, you know, is there anything that you need me to prepare, bring whatever, you know, and I, I ask that, you know, not at one thirty, but I ask a question like that at, you know, 9am. So I have plenty of time if I need to, to pull something together. And I think a lot of it too, is just making sure that there's a lot of accountability, you know, cause I, I enjoy that my team does hold me accountable that people, you know, that people know that they can rely on me and they, and they also know that if they, you know, if they follow up on something that I'll, I'll deliver it. So, you know, a lot of it is, yeah, keeping to my calendar, taking a lot of notes. I'm a big, I'm a big note taker. A little anecdote I'll share is uh, when I, when I used to work at uh, at GTM that became Woodmac, one of, one of my, one of my friends uh, who, who worked there at the time, Allison Junkins, we had, we had a, a, an all company meeting about something. And someone asked her why she wasn't taking notes. She said, oh, I know that Brett will take better notes than me and he'll just send me his notes afterwards. And, and she was joking a little bit, but, but I'm, a, I'm a big note taker. I like to have a lot of notes. I like to have things to, to refer back to because it's very helpful because you know I, I love making little check boxes and checking things off as I do them and trying to lay out every day saying, okay, these are the, these are the six or seven things I need to do today. And then I kind of think of them in a prioritized fashion of, you know, you know, of these, of these six or seven, you know, which ones need to be done right away, which ones can maybe wait a little bit. Okay. So have you ever had any career disasters? Disasters? That's a, that's a great question. I don't know if I've ever, I don't know if I've ever had anything I would classify as a, as a disaster, but I've definitely had, I've definitely had struggles. I, I, I've definitely had, had struggles. I can I can think of I can think of two two examples from my career that immediately come to mind. So the the first one was was back when I was uh, when I was an analyst at uh, at GTM. We did uh, you know anal, you know market analysis was my main role, but I also would sometimes be brought into consulting projects. And we had a client, and we had to we had to prepare a a deck for that for that client you know to answer some of their questions the 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 deck was you know i believe the deck was due something at like you know it was like end of the day friday basically so call it you know 5 5 p.m on friday and we're going to have an internal review about it at around you know two o'clock on friday just to to look at it internally and and iron out any last thing before we send to the client and you know i you know i i did my best with what i thought i knew and I showed it to my internal team and basically, you know, the, the head of the consulting project basically said, you know, we can't show this to the client. Like this is not a good enough quality. So the head of our team called the client and said, Hey, I really apologize. Can we push this out one day? Can we give it to you Saturday? And the, the client said, yep, no problem. So, you know, I, I felt terrible because it, you know, it meant that, you know, the, the project was was getting uh, delayed a little bit. You know, I worried that it would look, would reflect negatively on the team, would reflect negatively on me. But you know what I did is I I put my nose to the grindstone and I I I cranked out you know I cranked out those slides and I, I made them much better and and much deeper and and the client was when they saw the deck they were very happy. But I definitely I definitely felt like uh, you know I was I had I had missed the mark. And uh, another example I can actually think of is when when I was when I was in another another one of my roles one of my one of my commercial strategy roles we had uh, a call with a client and you know the this deal previously had been run basically in a kind of a one two punch of myself and uh, a member of our of our BD team and. You know, we had talked with this client. They seemed, you know, very happy about our our offering. Very happy to work with us. You know, we'd, you know, kind of ironed everything out, and uh, you know, so then we scheduled another call to kind of finalize things between ourselves and the other company. And we were bringing my manager into the call and our client liaison's manager into the call. And for whatever reason, on that call, I still don't know why to this day, our client liaison just came out swinging. 
uh, which he'd never done before. He was very like critical of our technology, very skeptical of everything we said. And it was very strange. It was like night and day. And, you know, I, I don't know why he did that, but, you know, it basically made myself and our, our, our BD, that, that BD colleague of mine look you know, caught us kind of flat footed. Uh, you know, we didn't look that good. It didn't look like we were, we were prepared or that we'd properly uh, explain things to the client. So ultimately I got a call afterwards from my manager basically said, you know, you, you got to do better. You have to make sure that, you know, you're, you're well prepared, that you know what the client wants, that you make sure that things like this don't happen. And, and, you know, he was right. He was, he was totally right. You know, and and the thing is too that that happened like right around the holidays that year. So it was one of those things too that I think it was you know maybe one or two days before kind of a, a holiday break, and you know it was very much like oh man, here I am going to the holidays. I thought I was just going to relax. We were going to have this this deal signed. Everything was going to be fine. And now here I am, not even you know not even not even sure what the future is going to hold for my for my role. But you know, in the end, we ironed things out. We managed to get uh, to get that contract. You know, we. We took a few days, we went back to that client, we gave them, you know, a, a proposal and we gave them, we answered a lot of their questions and, and everything ended up fine. But I think, you know, those would be, you know, if I had to say two times that were were definitely struggles that I can think of, but but I learned from them, right? And I think the the thing I would I would offer to to the listeners, especially if they're listeners who are either early in their career or are, are trying to get a career in energy or, or really a career in anything, is that there will always be, no matter what you do there will always be struggles. There will always be challenges. And the real test is how you respond to them and what you learn from them. Because every, you know, I've, I've made, I've made mistakes before and everyone will make mistakes. It's impossible to not make mistakes. The only way you won't make mistakes is, you know, is if you don't do anything, if you, if you do anything, you, you will make mistakes. And so you have to learn, I think, to, to recognize what what went wrong and see what lessons you can take from it so that next time you can do it twice as good or more. Okay, that's really good advice actually. So how do you, you were saying before that you're, you're good at putting together last minute requests that your boss has asked you to do. How do you go about doing that? So definitely, I think flexibility is very important in in any sort of, again, in any sort of role, but I think especially for a role like the one I have, because, you know, frankly, we are, you know, we're a younger company, you know, our, our resources are, are a little more limited than a, than a larger firm. So a lot of times it's just figuring out, you know, how to do, how to do things the, the best, the best we can, you know, really just thinking through and saying, you know, okay, this is, this thing has come up. It's clearly our priority. And you know it wouldn't have it wouldn't have come up this way if it if it weren't such a priority. So let's you know let's find a way to rebalance things. And and sometimes that you know that takes you know making uh you know making 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 difficult choices. You know so so for example you know if you know if if someone comes to me and says hey this thing is a real priority we need to get this done in the next few hours I say okay you know I normally was going to have a meeting or I had some other thing I was working on you know you know, maybe I reach out to the person I had the meeting with and say, Hey, is it okay if we push this, you know, a couple of hours or a couple of days and, and really just figuring out how you can, how you can manage it. And I think in those moments, you know, there's a, you know, the, the, the gut reaction for, for me, and I'm sure for many people, when, when something urgent comes is, you know, kind of a, kind of a tensing up, you know, it's a feeling of dread of like, Oh my God, what is this thing? you know, how, how will I do it in this limited time? But then what I try to do immediately afterwards is remind myself, you know, first off, I've done things like this before and I could do it again. And generally these people wouldn't come to you if they didn't think you could do it. So a lot of times it's also that recognition of, you know, in, in a way it's flattering because, you know, someone has something that they really need done and they come to you and they say, you know, I, I need your help. And that's, that's actually a really great feeling to know that you are someone that people, people can rely on, even in, even in difficult circumstances. Yes, it is actually. I think, I think it is. It's, um, yeah, I agree. So if you were going to hire someone, what would you look for? 
It's a good question. So I think, you know, I, I think the, you know, obviously, you know, the specific experiences and skill sets is going to depend on the role, but I think in a more broad based kind of soft skills side, when, when I'm hiring someone, I, you know, the, the kind of broad answer is I want someone who will be a joy to work with, but more specifically, what I, what I mean is, you know, someone who has a good attitude, someone who works hard, someone who's willing to take feedback, someone who's, who's also humble, you know, it's, it's, you know, it's great to have someone who's willing to admit that they don't know something or, or ask questions if they don't understand something, you know, someone who's, who's reliable, you know, that, you know, that if you give them an assignment, you can, you can reach them. Uh, And I think, you know, that point I made earlier about curiosity, I think someone who has innate curiosity and just wants to understand things and, and, you know, do, you know, do better. You know, there's a, there's a, a, a quote I've heard, I forget who said it, but it's something like to the effect of, you know, I'd rather, you know, I'd, I'd rather work with, you know, uh, you know, someone who's last, you know, last in the class, but is, you know, is, is a joy to work with than someone who's the valedictorian, but, you know, it, you know, is, is a lot more, uh, you know, kind of haughty. Right. So I think that's kind of, kind of what I think about, you know, and, and, you know, I think this, this, you know, this question does come at a good time because I did, I did interview a couple people for, uh, for one open role we have over the last week or so. So, you know, I do, I do have this a lot on the, on the mind recently. Okay. So can you describe your typical working week then? Typical work week. Yeah. That's, that's a very, that's a very good question. It's hard to give a typical week because the days, the days can vary. I think it's probably better if I, if I talk about it as kind of like a, like a, a, you know, a time kind of how my time is, is split because I think usually, you know, my, my work days are a combination of both internal and external meetings, doing analysis, trying to stay up to date on news and related items, putting together slide decks and supporting proposals. So, you know, I would, I would say a lot, especially recently, I'd say a lot of the work that I've been doing has been external meetings where I've been, it's either been with a potential client where I've been supporting our BD team by, you know, sharing insights with the, with the client, you know, answering their questions about the industry or, or storage, you know, helping make slide decks and presentations of things like, you know, case studies or, or, or uh, market size analyses, you know, total addressable market kind of things. I think the, you know, the, the other type of external meeting I've, I, I have a lot are, uh, are sitting in trade organizations or, or similar types of groups where, you know, we talk about, you know, how, you know, what's happening in the industry, what kind of policy is under discussion? How can we submit comments? What kind of comments should we submit? What are the trends we've noticed? What are some, you know, white papers or case studies we can write together and, and put out? What are some trends that we've noticed? And, you know, I think probably in my week, actually, maybe there is kind of a typical week thing. I feel like Monday through Thursday are really my, my meeting days. Those are the days when, when all the meetings seem to be scheduled. So I have a lot of, uh, a lot of discussions on, uh, on those days, but yeah, I mean, there's been, there's been also a lot, you know, when I have other time to have, uh, you know, internal meetings about planning things like our, you know, our, our goal setting or budget or, you know, discussions internally on certain tools we're thinking about purchasing or, uh, agreements we're thinking of, of entering into with, with external parties as we plan different aspects of our strategy. So, you know, that's, that's kind of a lot of the, the, the work that I do, you know, in the, you know, and in the, in the free moments I have, you know, I'm, I'm working on Excel models, I'm sending emails to, to people to set up meetings, I'm writing uh, white papers or internal documents that, that we can use to kind of improve our strategic position and understand what, what the market needs from our system. So there's, there's really a, a, a lot of varied things that I do on a, on a day-to-day basis. Okay. And I've just remembered that question I was going to ask you. I just wondered, because you work in quite a small company, do you think that's advantageous to, to your career development rather than being... Oh, definitely. Yeah, definitely. 
without it without a doubt i think it's the it's the kind of thing where if you're in you know if you're in a small company i think it's there's there's kind of two pieces to it i think one piece is you know if there are fewer people the contributions of one individual i think stand out a lot more just by nature of the fact that you know the you know the 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 actual activities the number of activities that are going on are are easier to to have everyone see them and I would also say because of a small company, you know, that point I said earlier about, you know, the, the resources available to you, because there aren't always as many, as, as many resources, it means that individuals have to often step up a lot more. You know, it's the kind of situation where there are certain projects where, you know, I, I know that I'm the single point of contact and I need to, to get it done. You know, if, if I, if I don't do it, it's, it's not going to, you know, it'll probably still get done, but it won't get done the necessarily um, to the level it needs to. And that's, you know, that's, that's very, you know, it, it can be very scary, but it's also very exciting, right? Because I definitely feel, uh, you know, this might sound silly, but I feel like a rock star some days, you know, that I'm, I, I you know, I feel, you know, that, you know, I know that I am a, a subject matter expert and I feel good about the fact that people turn to me and call me from across the company and say, you know, hey, Brett, what's your view on this? What's your view on that? You know, how can you support this thing? So really, you know, there's there's a there's there's a lot of opportunities, I think, if you're at a small organization. But I mean, you know, there are not to not to not to fence it too much, but there are there are advantages too of, of being in a larger firm, right? I mean, there's definitely being in a, a smaller company, you have to be comfortable, I think, with a lot more uncertainty. You have to be comfortable with the fact that, you know, there's going to be, you know, there will, there will be a lot more changes and they'll generally happen more rapidly versus, you know, versus a larger company. Okay. So why do you feel like a rock star then some days? Uh, well, I think, I think a big reason is just because, because people are, are so kind and so excited by what I bring to the table. You know, people, when I, when I first joined the company, you know, I, I had word, word of my deeds had already been spread before I joined. And so I came in and people were like, oh, Brett, I'm so excited to meet you. I've heard so many good things about you. And, you know, people were, you know, were asking me for support with different projects that were in process. And, you know, I would, I would deliver, you know, a, a page or, or different notes or anything. And they would be like, wow, this is exactly what we needed. This is great. This is amazing. I would have never thought of that. And and it it makes me feel great. It makes me feel great that I'm part of a team that that is so excited by what I bring to the table and and really understands the value of the things that I know how to do. And you know I'm you know and I'm by no means the only rock star on the team. I think everyone on our team, again, it sounds kind of trite, but I think everyone on our team is a is a rock star. I think that's the thing too, because we're a small team. Everyone we we have on our team, we we were very you know, methodical and who we chose and why. So every, everyone on the team is, is amazing at, at whatever they do. Right. You know, it's, it's not, not everyone can do everything, but each individual can do the things that they're best at extremely well. And that's why you have a diverse team to make sure that, you know, because there's certain things that, you know, I have no clue how to do, but I'm very grateful that I have colleagues who are experts in it. Okay. That's really interesting actually, because you were saying that a lot of people admire and, and like the knowledge that you have and would ask you for questions, which is an amazing, it must be an amazing feeling in itself, but it must take a long time to get to that point in your career. Because there could be some graduates that might, I mean, even, not even graduates, I mean, in any, in any, any age, in any, any career level that you're going into, if you're starting a new job, people might feel when they're starting that they might they're getting to know the different company and you're knowing your procedures and things like in the processes and things like that. And people will automatically think, oh, I wish I knew more. But then it takes time to learn this. Do you think that that it does take time to get to a certain level in, of knowledge in your career? hundred hundred percent. It, it does, it does take a long time. I mean, when I, you know, it, you know, when I first started as an energy storage analyst, I was definitely, I was definitely floored by how much I didn't know. And, and not only things I didn't know, but things I didn't know, I didn't know. Right. 
you know, I, 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 I can think of, you know, a number of examples, right. And it's, it's, it's a, it's, it is a process. It's a learning process. I'm still learning every day. I mean, there's tons of things I still don't know. There's tons of things I still don't fully understand. And all you can do is, is really, I think, take your time and, and ask good questions. It's something I try very hard to do is I try to think of ways to explain very complicated aspects of the industry in more uh, clear and direct terms. Because I think, you know, especially for people who've been in the industry a long time, you can get very caught up in, you know, jargon and abbreviations. And then before you know it, you know, you, you, you rattle off an entire paragraph and the person you're speaking to, you know, doesn't know, doesn't know at all what you've said. And that can be very intimidating. So I think, you know, I think if you're coming into this industry, you know, the, usually the advice I give, cause I've, I've had, I've had students reach out to me in the past and ask me for, for advice. And you know, one of the pieces of advice I said to them, as I said, if you want to be in the energy industry every day, just read three articles about the energy industry, like whatever aspect of the energy industry you're most interested in, just read three articles that, that came out. Cause there's plenty of, there's plenty of news sources out there. You know, there's Canary media, there's energy storage news, you know, PB magazine, you know, Bloomberg, there's all these, all these great, uh, you know, news services that you can, that you can read from. And, you know, just read, just read three articles a day. And, you know, before you know it, you won't be an expert, but you'll know a lot more than you, than you did before. And I think honestly, a lot of the, the best way to learn is to just learn, learn on the job and, and be willing to put yourself in situations that may be uncomfortable, you know, going to, you know, going to conferences or, or sitting in on webinars, you know, you know, just trying to immerse yourself in the industry and learn every everything that you can and then you know before you know it you'll know a lot more but there's no way you'll know uh you'll you'll know everything because this in you know the world is so complicated but even if you just take the small slice of the world that is the energy industry there's you know there's there's so much to learn and, and everything's changing you know we're, we're actually at you know again i i worry it sounds kind of trite but we really are at probably the most exciting time in the energy industry in the last 100 years, you know, since kind of the, the grid started, because now there's being such a change of how, how things were always done is now changing in such a fundamental way. And there's so many new opportunities for growth and change and innovation, you know, and it's, it's, it's amazing. It's so, it's, it's so exciting for me to see. And I'm so proud of how, how far we as, we as an industry have come in, in even only the eight years that I've been in it. Sounds amazing. So I was going to ask you, do you have any advice for anybody looking to come into the energy sector? Hmm, uh, any advice? So, so, you know, obviously my advice from the last question, the, the three articles a day definitely stands, but I think another another thing that can be worth it to do is find ways to get involved in the energy industry before you're ever in it. So if there are local groups like you know like a you know a young professionals and energy group in your in your hometown try to get involved in that. If there are webinars that sound interesting to you, try to sign up for them. There's tons of free webinars every week that are done by all sorts of organizations like you know Wood McKenzie does them, you know, uh, Rocky Mountain Institute does them, you know, all these different clean, uh, clean energy group. There's so many places that, that do them. And you can also watch, you know, recordings of older ones, uh, as well. I would also say, try to do informational interviews. Uh, you know, I, I think one of the best things I ever did in, in graduate school, you know, I feel like I keep name dropping on this call, but I, I, I want to give credit to people who have really helped me because there, there have been a lot. But there was a guy who he was an alum of my grad program. His name is Miguel Sosa. And he came to an alumni uh, career event while I was still a student at Michigan. And, you know, he, he, he basically, you know, I was asking him some questions about his career trajectory. And he, you know, he gave me his business card and he said, I've enjoyed talking to you. I have to go now. But what I want you to do is I want you to take my business card and I want to see an email from you in my inbox by Monday morning that sets out 
what you want to talk about and when you're available to talk to me for half an hour. And that was such a powerful thing that he did because that got me on the route to doing informational interviews. And so, you know, I started just reaching out to people at different companies, um, you know, often trying to find people who had something in common. So, you know, usually the, the easiest way was seeing if they either went to, to Michigan or NYU and I would just reach out to them and I'd say, you know, hi, my name's Brett. I'm, you know, I'm a student. I'm very interested in the company you work for. I would love it if you would be willing to make even just 15 minutes to get on the phone with me and let me ask some questions about your career. And I learned so much from those calls, you know, and, and some of those people ultimately became my peers in the energy industry. And it's, it's, it's a really good way to build yourself a network to learn more. And, you know, it's also possible that's a way you can get a job. You know, I've, I, you know, not me personally, but I've known people who, you know, they, they did a networking interview with someone. And then, you know, a few, you know, a few months later, they saw a job opening at the, the position. They said, you know, Hey, that, you know, you reach out to your contact and you say, Hey, I saw this opening here. I'm going to apply for it. I'd really appreciate it if you can, you know, tell the hiring manager about me or something, because especially in this day and age, when, you know, hiring managers are so inundated that, that can, that can really, uh, really make a difference. If you can do anything to, to, to push yourself higher up in the line, uh, it's, it's a, it's a good thing. So highly, highly recommend informational interviews, you know, I mean, heck, if anyone who listens to this podcast wants to wants to do an informational interview with me and 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 talk to me for 15 minutes, I, I'm not gonna promise that I will I will have time for everyone, but but you know, definitely, you know, if you know, I'd I'd be more than willing if a couple of people reach out, I'd be more than willing to to get on the phone for a, a quick chat to share, you know, more details about my role and, and my experiences. That's amazing, actually. I never really thought about doing that. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, it's very, it's very powerful. You know, I mean, I mean, it's almost like what, you know, in a way what you do, Michelle, right. I mean, you, 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 you get on the, you know, you get on the podcast with all these different people and you, you hear their perspectives and you learn so much. I mean, you're, you're, you're definitely a wealth of, of knowledge on all this stuff as well. I never really thought about it like that, but um, <laughs> so how would you go about setting up a, an informational interview? So usually, usually it's it's as simple as you know the, the 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 best way to do it is if you have the person's direct email. But if that doesn't work, uh, LinkedIn is a good a good secondary choice. So usually it's just send a very short message and just say you know hi my name is whatever you know I'll just say Brett in this case because that's who I am. Hi my name is Brett. I am you know and then say your you know your your position at the time. You know I'm a student. I'm a you know, I, I'm a consultant, whatever you are. And, you know, I, I was, you know, I was looking up your company and I saw, you know, I saw your name and, you know, if there's another connection, you can mention it, you know, like I got your name from a friend or, you know, I see that, you know, you also went to the university of Michigan and, you know, I would love to learn a little bit more about your role. Here are some times that I'm available over the next week, but I can be flexible if, if you need it. And then that's it, you know, just very short, sweet to the point. And it's, you know, it's, it's very powerful and, and you'll be surprised, you know, uh, you'll, you'll be surprised, pe- you know, how many people will actually respond. And, you know, I won't guarantee, you know, that everyone will respond and I won't guarantee that everyone responds will have, will have availability. Right. But, but there are plenty of people who are very kind, very generous with their time and, you know, and, and, and a thing, a thing I think about too, a lot is, and I might've said this already, which if so, I apologize for repeating myself, but I feel a lot like I can never, I can never fully pay back the people who helped me get where I am. That's just impossible. So what I have to do instead is pay it forward so that the next generation of people can get a lot of the help that, that I was, that I was, that I was so uh, blessed to receive. And that's and that is an amazing thing as well. So I'm gonna wrap it up. I was gonna ask you one maybe one final question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Go go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. I, you, this you to ask. I think I ask this to everybody. If you could turn back time, would you change anything? <laughs> I mean, I I think everyone would answer would answer yes, but uh I think I'll focus just on my on my career. I would say yes. I would ch- I I can think of one thing that I, that I would, that I would change. I think, you know, very early on in my career, 
I was not at, I, I was not good at asking for help or admitting when I didn't understand something. And I think definitely that caused some, some struggles, probably I'd say in the first like year, like call it year to year and a half of uh, my, my, my job. And, you know, I, I managed and I did fine, but I think, I, I think a lot of the, the struggles I had and a lot of the, the stress I experienced, I could have gotten around if I'd just been, you know, if I'd just been willing instead of trying to say, oh, I understand this and then figure it out myself to tell the person, oh, no, I don't understand this because you explain it to me. It probably would have saved me a lot of time, uh, a lot of a lot of challenges. And so I think, you know, I think admitting you don't know something and asking for help are two of the most powerful things you can you can do, not just in your career, but in, in life in general. I agree, actually. I do agree. So I'm going to wrap it up now. That's all the questions I have today. I'd like to thank Brett for your time. That brings us to the end of another episode. Thanks for listening and see you next week. Thanks so much, Michelle. Really appreciate it. Oh, you were amazing. That brings us to the end of another episode. Thanks for listening. If you enjoyed the show, I'd like to gently encourage you to leave a five-star rating wherever you listen to podcasts and share the show with another person. You can also follow me on LinkedIn or via my website, www.michellefraserconsultancy.com. Thanks again for listening and see you next week.